So good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Danielle Dreilinger in conversation with Stephanie Rohr. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfield's Books and I'll also be your host for the evening. For 40 years, Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together. So just a couple of housekeeping items to note before we get started. I will be using the chat box to provide links for upcoming Copperfields events, details for purchasing tonight's title, as well as discount codes. And I'll also include my personal contact details for follow up. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go to with any questions or comments for the speakers. The format will feature between 30 to 40 minutes of speaking and will then be followed by a live Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. Please go ahead and submit your questions and comments there rather than replying to me in the chat box. So without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce tonight's author, Danielle Dreilinger. Danielle is a former New Orleans Times education reporter and a Knight Wallace journalism fellow. She also wrote for the Boston Globe and worked at the Boston NPR station, WGBH. She lives in New Orleans, Louisiana. And in conversation with Danielle tonight is Stephanie Rohr. Stephanie is a cross-stitch a cross designer, fiber artist, and author. She has been using cross-stitch to subvert expectations of traditional needlework since 2010 when she started her Etsy shop, Steph X Stitch. Her work uses the cross-stitch medium to further feminist and progressive causes and ideas. So they are with us tonight to discuss Danielle's captivating debut, The Secret History of Home Economics, How Trailblazing Women Harness the Power of Home and Change the Way We Live. I know we're all really excited to dive in. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Stephanie. All right. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to do this. Um, I have to say that I am not a huge nonfiction book reader, but I loved reading this book so much. Um, thank you. That's an especial compliment. It is. Um, yeah, and just because it was so, your voice is so funny and knowledgeable and it just really felt like a good friend telling me all these super interesting things that I had no idea about uh, when it came to home economics. So yeah, I think really just the most interesting thing is how much I didn't know I had that stereotypical idea of what people think about of like the 1950s housewife and it's just cooking and it's about, you know, women staying at, at home. But um, especially learning about the origins of it was so fascinating to me. So I don't know, I kind of wanted to just start off with that um, beginning origins of it with like Ellen Richards, especially. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I didn't know anything about that history either at all. Uh, I came up with the idea because I you know, was looking for a book idea that connected education and race, gender and class and history. And I thought, you know, it would be that it should also talk, you know, speak to my my hobbies, really. Like I cook a lot, I knit, I do cross stitch, I, uh, you know, crochet. And I put all those, I was thinking like what sort of fell within that nexus. And I was like, oh, home economics. Cause I was like, oh, the, the class that taught girls how to cook and sew because that's, you know, what I knew as well. And I mean, I took home economics in the early nineties and it was co-ed, but, you know, it still had that, you know, deep women's only tradition. And in fact, as I learned while I was uh, doing my research, uh, home economics, it wasn't until 19, the 1970s with the passage of Title IX that home economics became, you know, it well, became illegal to put boys and shopping girls in home ec. Um, and even then, when I was thinking about it, I thought like, well, you know, why hasn't that come back? Like, it just seemed like there was so much in our culture that spoke to the concerns of, of that I thought were addressed by home economics with things like people watching Project Runway and HGTV and the Food Network and, you know, craftivism, like your own project and, you know, a fears about like adulting and do our kids know, you know, how to cook? And even 
as an education reporter, there was this pushback against standardized tests and you know strict hard academic subjects. So even then, I thought like, oh well, how every so often you see something saying like, oh, that we should bring back home ec. Uh, but then the first thing that I learned when I started to work on the project was a, about Ellen Richards. And she is one of the founders of home economics. And she was the first woman to go to MIT. So like it just immediately, and she was a chemistry. It wasn't that MIT was teaching home economics. She was a chemist. And that just immediately like just blew my mind. I was like, clearly there is so much here that I don't know that like we don't, the general public doesn't know about how home economics started. And the more I dug in, just the more I learned, you know, the more, the more sh like really surprising things that I learned. Mm -hmm. And one thing I really loved, especially about the learning about the early proponents and creators of what became home economics was how it was kind of started almost as an intellectual haven for women and women of color and queer women who, which is not the automatic thing you think of um, when most people would think of home economics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So home economics was created by women who were career women. And some of them were married, a few, you know, some of them were married to men. Um, most were single or had, you know, lifelong partnerships with other women or, you know, if the ones who were married only rarely had children or some of them were widowed or divorced and, you know, needing to uh, provide for their families or provide for themselves. But, you know, even, so the very first person in the field, Catherine Beecher, who wrote a book in 1841 advocating, you know, what she called domestic economy. She had like this very traditionalist mindset or like that she, you know, proposed about, uh, women's place is in the home, but we need to glorify that place because women are forming the citizens of tomorrow. And, you know, she made it sound sort of, it, it was sort of a game that home economists would later play of making it sound traditional or making it something that, you know, men could see as like being something for that fit into women's, you know, like place in the home. But in, that in reality was this you know, way for women to have careers and especially careers in business and science. And Catherine Beecher herself, she was single. She was an educational, women's education pioneer. She was one of the Beecher family of, you know, abolitionists and preachers. She never married. She was a textbook writer and started two schools and, you know, decided that, you know, she just sort of completely complicated this idea that our society has that women just naturally know how to do this stuff from like something that, you know, hangs out when you get a second X chromosome or something. Cause she said, this is something that needs to be taught in school because, you know, it's not something that anybody innately knows how to do. And it, you know, it really isn't. <laughs> That's definitely true. Um, yeah. It, I like that you mentioned about how Ellen Richards was a chemist because I think there's this divide in people's minds between like hard science and home economics, which is more of a soft science or even an art. Mm -hmm. And I just think there's certainly room for that. I mean, I can't sit here as an embroidery artist and say that there's not room for that, but it's really so much more than that. Yeah, yeah, it is. And the you we only got that home ec is soft, science is hard division after World War II, when because home economics had succeeded so well, and because doors had op were opening for women to go directly into engineering or physics, that people started, it started pushing girls into home economics instead of science. But so the original, the founders of home economics, uh, with Ellen and uh, a bunch of other women in the late 19th century, they, they wanted to do two things. They wanted to bring science into the home and make it accessible for people who are taking care of the house, which was almost always women and occasionally like men of color. And the 
most of the, the, the white leaders of home economics were not thinking about men of color, which is you know another piece of the complicated story. But they wanted to bring science into the house to make it more efficient and make women smarter consumers, more, you know, and have them focus on what was healthy and necessary in their home to have a good, you know, to have a healthy life. But that would free them up then from drudgery because keeping house then was extraordinarily physically demanding so that they would have time to study, to take paid work, to be with their children, to get involved in civic affairs, to, you know, do anything they wanted. And they simultaneously were using the, using the home to create a range of careers in science and business that would be acceptable to men because they seemed like they were kind, you know, it, they were girly basically. So for instance, you know, Ellen Swallow Richards asked MIT, I mean, MIT didn't take women. She was the first. And at first they had her as a, really like an audit, you know, basically she was auditing and just women couldn't get jobs in science labs, but they could get jobs. Once uh, home economics started and women started making their own college departments, women could get jobs studying chemistry as long as it was like the chemistry of eggs, of egg whites and like chemical reactions for different kinds of leaveners. But then they could do that. Like in the thirties, Iowa State had, a sub major, like a minor within home, I guess concentration within home economics that was electrical engineering. And they called it household equipment because you could study electrical engineering as long as it was under the guise of like, you can, you know, figure out how to make the stove work. Yeah. I think it really, a lot of these women who started it, it really speaks to how, and even later on, it speaks to how women had this extra task historically of not just creating these new ideas and bringing them to people. They kind of had to bend over backwards and do all this sneaky stuff, mm. package it in a way that would be acceptable to who had the money and who had the power at the time and who right. would allow them to get that message out to more people. Right, definitely. And you can see that in like the most, one of the most progressive early home economists, a woman named Carolyn Hunt, who is ama just so amazing. She just, she didn't want, she, she was teaching, I think it was the University of Wisconsin. She was running the home economics program there. And she had no interest in teaching cooking because she was like, this is not about, like, that's not what home economics is about. It's about, you know, these larger structures of how like we can attain greater freedom and like freedom for everybody, you know, freedom for the people from the, you know, send your laundry out, but let's get good working conditions for the people working in laundry, you know, laundromats. And she had lost her job. I mean, because she wasn't being, you know, she, she was in this agriculture school and they wanted, the guys wanted to say like, but like, are we preparing the farm wife for taking care for life on the farm? And alternatively, uh, two women who really succeeded uh, Martha Van Rensselaer and Flora Rose, who were, you know, life, romantic life partners and created the Cornell School, College of Home Economics together, you know, they served as the catering crew for Cornell in the early years of what they were doing when there were luminaries who were like had to be fed in this small town because they realized that like they had to play this game in order to do the other things that they wanted to do. And it's interesting that you mentioned the um, farm wives because um, I think of this as a, like once again the stereotype of Homac is such a suburban middle class, mm -hmm. kind of isolated within your own home idea. And I really liked reading about. I think Margaret Murray Washington was one of these people who really wanted to reach out to rural and farming communities and focus more on community centered. Um, home economics rather than just individuals. Yeah, yeah. So I think there was, you know, there were a bunch of tensions within the field from early on, and you know, including, you know, how much are we talking about individual effort and how much are we talking about societal change? Uh, and this is an issue that, you know, the field is still dealing with now. And I was, uh, you know, attending the virtual conference last week of what you. American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences. And this was the big issue that, you know, I was talking about. Uh, 
And Margaret Murray Washington did an amazing job of like connecting the, you know, creating a through line for that. She was uh, an extraordinary woman. She was born at the waning days of the Civil War in Mississippi, Black woman born to a Black washerwoman and an Irish railroad man who I, I don't think she ever knew him. And she was just obviously, she must have been just so obviously smart. And, but you know, there were no schools for Black children in her hometown at that time. Uh, she was taken under the wing of a white couple who were Quakers, not couple, sorry, brother and sister who had come down from the North uh, to educate freed people. And she ended up going to Fisk College and earning a bachelor's degree and becoming a college professor at Tuskegee, uh, where she then married Booker T. Washington and became the brand home economics for decades. But she became, you know, she did so, she, I I'm, was, I'm exhausted just thinking about every, all the work that she did. She formed a club, which is, has, is seen as this very like, you know, fancy middle-class lady thing where you play classical music and they did play classical music, but they also like took over the local reformatory for African-American like troubled teenagers and turned it into a school. They, and she created these mother's meetings for women who were living on the, a former plantation, but still pretty much living in the old slave cabins with very few resources that she sent like a te teachers out to their community and she taught them house care, like housekeeping skills. In fact, edited a, a book, a, like a booklet of advice for very poor Southern black women and made the, you know, explicit connection that this was not just about like having a happier home. It was about gaining respect politically and power uh, and like erasing slavery and like attaining moral, like she trained uh, women in home economics. And she was saying like, we're not, I'm not training maids. Like I am training moral leaders who are going to go back to their communities and share these skills and, you know, lift up their compatriots. So, and, and you can certainly, you know, question whether her tactics were, I don't know, effective, but she was an ex, you know, she believed it. And she really, she, she clearly changed the lives of a I don't know how many people. Definitely. Um, so I really enjoyed the chapters about um, how World War I and World War II both really shaped the direction that home economics went in. Um, yeah, I wondered if you could speak on that and kind of maybe like food conservation or how people really had to start DIYing stuff that they were not DIYing before. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And so home economics really started coming into its like public view during World War I because of this work that home economists were leading in conservation uh, for you know, the war effort. Because rationing was voluntary, it wasn't mandatory. So you had all of these home economics classes like sewing clothing for the Red Cross and for soldiers and for uh, uh, you know, refugees. And uh, somewhere, I think it was the um, Fiber Nation podcast uh, pointed out that that's where knitting got the Kitchener stitch, which if you, know, you guys are knitters, you will know how everyone, it's how you seam, you, it's to seam up the toe seamlessly and like knitters kind of cl classically really hate it. But that was for World War I because even the slightest friction in the trenches, uh, you know, further trench foot and all those horrible, you know, debilitating illnesses that soldiers were uh, subject to. And Martha Van Rensselaer went to Washington to work with the U.S. Food Administration to put out all sorts of recipes that Flora Rose and the, you know, Cornell team we're testing about like stuff that feeds into how we eat now, like how to, you know, substitute legumes for meat, how to make desserts with less sugar or baked goods with less, you know, barley instead of wheat. 
Um, and this continued in the depression and also in World War II. And it, it, I think I find it especially interesting like looking back because home economics is not really per se, like it's not just about DIYing. Like I, they, they often want, like home economists were very savvy about who needed to like, do you need, like, is it a good idea to make your own clothes? And sometimes the answer was absolutely yes. Like sometimes, you know, you are making, you, you've got access to flower sacks. Okay, you're gonna make, we're gonna help you make dresses out of flower sacks. You, uh, Fabiola de Baca, this is amazing woman in New Mexico, who was the first full-time Latina and bilingual employee of the New Mexico uh, Home Economics Extension Service. She helped uh, Nate, Latina and Native American women buy pressure canners, which you know can can a lot more items safely, like meat, you know, than a pot of boiling water. And you know, she wrote up an estimate of like how many hundreds of thousands of dollars she had saved these just you know dirt poor people in the depression. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, you know, home economists are pretty savvy about, you know, is it, does it make, a lot of cases they would say like, it doesn't make sense to sew your own clothes because like, what's the value of your own time? Like they were the first to study, like what's the value of a woman's time? Like that's not, you know, I think of it whenever I think of uh, people in Louisiana eating crawfish, like crawfish is the ultimate food for people who have more time than money because, you know, they're tiny and you have to eat like pounds of them to fill up. But, you know, they were just, they filled the, you know, canals and all of, and the swamps. So if you have more time than money, crawfish are a great idea. Yeah. I think that time versus money thing and kind of working smarter, not harder is a thing that can be missed about home economics because it's not like there's this moral value in scrubbing each and every dish if you could afford to buy a dishwasher and free up your time to do something else. So it actually works to help women pursue other things, whether it's careers or hobbies or more time with their kids, um, mm. rather than, you know, just spending all that time making the home. Yeah. And to be sure, I mean, home economists could like fall on the wrong side. It could be on the side of the problem as well on this because so after starting in the 1920s, because they were experts on the consumer, like women, you know, who were, you know, determining the household budget, uh, they began getting these jobs in business as consumer relations experts and as marketers. And their job was to, you know, educate the consumer, but you know, really their job was to sell products. And so in the 1950s, and I have you know, a whole chapter on this, you know, they were totally complicit in all of the, you know, feminine mystique, like, do you have the shiniest floor stuff that really, you know, ate up a lot of time that, you know, I think we can all agree is just like, you know, is not like you do not like it, the standards for the housekeeping standards for women like went up as the technology <laughs> improved to make it you know take less time and when i talked i mean when i talked to some of the women in that field like they were they didn't really see that it they they managed to find a way to sort of like elide the tensions in what they were doing and they really believed in what they were doing but home economists who were like not in business are like yeah that was all kind of selling out yeah i mean this is kind of a very small tangent but i really enjoy looking at old recipe books um kind of horrifying ones that are all very gelatin based yes um, this book kind of finally answered my question of why it exists because so many of them were selling jello they were selling Jello. <laughs> these, you know, products. So they have to concoct these salads of just vegetables suspended in gelatin. Yes. Um, Though I will say that 
I have been reminded by a food writer colleague of my former colleague that there were a lot of people in a lot of places who really loved those jello salads. Like I, so it's not totally, I mean, if, if people hadn't want, if those recipes hadn't actually worked to sell more jello, they would have stopped writing that. That is true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that was more of a personal illumination of a mystery. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's so many, one thing you can find in flea markets like all over the country is you can find endless microwave cookbooks written by like corporate home economists, which, you know, it's understandable. This new device had come out. And so like every place that was selling microwaves, whether that be manufacturers or stores, all of the you know ingredient companies they all had their home economists put out these microwave cooking cookbooks and that's like i feel like that's the 70s version of like the terrifying jello salads like these appalling like microwave a baked potato you <laughs> don't I, mean, I have been guilty of that on a few occasions but it's much better in the oven <laughs> <laughs> well um i kind of wanted to move into some um mental health connections through yeah. um, whether it's crafting or other uh, things you mention in your book because I'm definitely very interested in that that's something that comes up a lot um, in my own work yeah well I feel like like, like let's more generally like start with like like craft like the place of crafting and the place of textiles in home economics is actually surprisingly complicated like i for instance went into this project assuming that there would be all of these like home economics and knitting patterns that i would find and then like you know be able to make and you know i don't know like give like present to people as like, here's like a home economics knitting guide. And the, the, but that wasn't the case. Like you don't have knitting in home economics and you don't have cross stitch except for, uh, so there was something that like on occasion, it was something that Ellen Richards really hated was that like city girls in like public schools were being taught to do fancy embroidery instead of like productive sewing. And she just thought that that was a really dumb use of time. And even sewing, like on the one hand, it is so tenacious in home economics, like the stereotype is stitching and stirring, but it's always been really like problematized because there were people all along saying like, this is not a good use of women's time, you know, many, you know, many women's time. Mm -hmm. And today, you know, there's a lot of, it's almost like it's in by by habit in some ways, but like I met a you know I write about a really innovative like an Ellen Richards style home economics teacher who taught hand sewing mm -hmm. because she thought like that was useful, but she got rid of the sewing machines because it's not a life skill like a necessary. It's not life skill the way that like cooking dinner is a life skill and it's not a job skill like not really if you're going to become a fashion designer sure but like most I mean we're talking about like you know if we're talking about high school kids and you know most sewing machine jobs are sweatshop jobs and they're not in the U.S. anyway so like it just seemed really fraught but at the same time when I and there's so many people, like people aren't, home economics teachers are often not taught how to sew or to teach sewing, which is harder yeah. in college. Like it's not part of the educator standards. So they are all like learning the you know, on the fly in their first year on the job. But all that said, like when I sat, I sat in on a bunch of sewing classes and the you know teenagers loved it. Loved it, loved it. They loved how hands-on it was. They love how productive it feels. They love that they can make, you know, handmade presents that feel really special. And they love, and you know, and they love how like 
soothing it is. Like, you know, it like, like all fiber crafting, like no matter how much, you know, yes, you have those moments where you want to throw the whole thing across the room, but like they get you like the getting into flow state and just, you know, zoning, focusing in it like that. They really, like, I, I felt you know, it was moments like this where I was like, I hate to like take this away from like these stressed out kids. Yeah, no, I, I do see your point though. And I think like that making makers trend is kind of a separate, this book really showed me how that's like such a separate thing. Um, although I do remember when I only took home ec for one semester in middle school and it was called facts, family and computer sciences, but then right after that, they'd always say, it means home ec. There's nobody right. what that meant. <laughs> right, and the people who are listening to part of what happened, and actually anyone who's in California, California retained the name home economics a lot longer, but back in the early 90s, the field rebranded to try to get away from the stereotypes. They mostly call themselves family and consumer sciences now, though there's still colleges that call themselves human ecology or human development or human sciences or something like that. And to that, that was in the Midwest. That was in Illinois, so mm. in the mid-90s as well. <laughs> yeah, the, um, not controversy, but kind of all the debate and discussion around what the name of this field should be was also really interesting to learn about in your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they want, wanted and want respect. And, you know, I when I went through, like, everything they had been dealing with, like, I'm not surprised that they chose to that they thought that maybe rebranding would would help, but it just you know yeah the name the new names never caught on. Everyone just says what's facts? Oh, it's you know home ec. <laughs> yes, but I think you know the question the question of crafting like on the one hand home economics is not the same as crafting. On the other hand, they do have like this like everybody asks me about knitting and sewing is be like there is that connection so in fact and when you know the news came out in the spring with your you know your book being too saucy for michael's my <laughs> i really do hope by the way that you like have a new pattern that's like too sa that's like just says like too saucy for michael's <laughs> maybe yeah so for those who don't know i have a book called feminist cross stitch and it is a how-to book um and it has 40 patterns, five of which contain adult words in them. And um, it was taken out of all Michael's stores and in many cases destroyed. So yeah, you can read about it in the New York Times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and what you were saying before is I, I think it goes both ways because as a crafter and a fiber artist, I get asked about kind of more home ecky things or more practical fiber arts. Cause they'll be like, oh, you're like a professional cross stitcher. Can you hem my pants? And I'm like, absolutely not. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how to create anything that's practical. I just create things that are pretty to look at. Yeah. Well, but I think, you know, one of the, one of the ways, so feminist, you know, second wave feminism in the seventies had a really fascinating, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Collision with yeah. home economics. And this wonderful, uh, this amazing moment wherein Robin Morgan, this you know, author, she edited the anthology Sisterhood is Powerful. She, you know, was very well known at the time, a little less well known now, though she is still like absolutely going strong. And she was in the American Home Economic Home Economics Association invited her in 1971 to talk about like women's changing roles. Uh, and she just ripped him a new one. And she wrote this amazing speech about how like, when you guys are every woman in the, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but like every woman in this country like goes through your hands and when you're done with her, she is, you know, a limp, jabbering mass of jelly fit for nothing but marriage. <laughs> and they, but sorry, say again? I said she did not mince words. Oh no, no, she did not. And you know, she but and the the American Home Economics Association, which you know had invited her, <laughs> <laughs> you know, had like this real just come to Jesus 
about it. And she, she really, you know, they didn't realize the extent to which people thought that they were reactionary. Like they knew that they were pushing against like sexist college administrators who wanted to cut their departments, but that had been the case forever. So like they didn't realize the extent to which there was this whole like wave of new wave of feminists coming out who like, I mean, and it, like Cornell Home Economics College hosted the first academic women's studies conference in the country. So once they realized this though, I mean, they really did a one, well, I'm 180, but they really went full stream ahead into embracing feminism, they endorsed the ERA. They printed her speech in its entirety in the Journal of Home Economics, which I, they did not, you know, was, I mean, they would sometimes, they would do that with like the keynote maybe, right? But they gave it like a whole, they set it off, they gave it like a whole issue. This covers like what Robert Morgan said in Denver. And they like created a committee to just do all this breastfeeding and, you know, went through their curricula and like, looked at ways in which they were unwittingly reinforcing gender stereotypes and consciously started promote, you know, writing about families that weren't straight nuclear families, right? So they did all this cool feminist, like overtly feminist work. And, you know, Phyllis Schlafly noticed, she like sued them <laughs> in the eighties. They, there was this textbook trial of home economics textbooks in Alabama that was, you know, funded by the, you know, Pat Robertson and Schlafly's groups. But, you know, at the same time, there was all of this feminist activism going on, like that just didn't, and they never, like in, the message never got back to the other feminists. And I can't, I should say that, you know, I was thinking of this specifically because, you know, with fiber arts, this is, you know, the late 60s and the 70s is when you have this blossoming of feminist fiber arts and you have like Judy Chicago and you have like all of these women like elevating, weaving and quilting and saying like, these are fine arts materials and we're going to do, you know, we, you know, some of our stuff is going to have overt feminist messages in it. And some of it is just going to be like inherently like I'm using a quilt as a fine art piece. And so, you know, that was all, I, I was originally going to put something about that into the book, but that it just, you know, fell by the wayside. <laughs> well, no, that definitely veers into a different area too, but I, I see it personally and with other fiber artists I know of you know, fiber art as an art form still being undervalued compared to painting, sculpting, any other form of art, um, and suspecting that it is because it is seen as women's work or just crafting or, oh, like everyone had to make a sampler when they were a little girl and now you just put a F word on it and now you're selling it. I'm like, yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> so, um, a couple things before we turn over to questions too. Another thing I really loved was how on the forefront of new technology, mm. anonymous were, and I'm forgetting her name, I'm sure you'll remind me, but the woman who went around demonstrating electricity and bringing electricity to places that didn't have it. And then even um, the woman who helped design astronaut food, which I thought was super cool because I'm a big nerd about NASA and I ate astronaut ice cream when I was a kid and thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, I myself thought it tasted like styrofoam, like that melted in your mouth. But like, I, I mean, I wanted to eat it because it was space food. <laughs> I think yeah, it, it was more the novelty than the actual taste. Yeah. But just like, that's the kind of thing I would never think about as being home economics before I read your book. And now I'm like, obviously it is. Right. And actually, you know, the way I found out about, I got in, I dug into the space food uh topic because you know but the, not the, a lot of this work a lot of what i found like it didn't exist easily you know and like a, it's not like i didn't like crib from someone else's like book and that was my book right like so i just began i just got like a sense like sensitized over time to oh i bet home economists were involved in that and I heard a gastropod episode about military food and the technology of military food. And I was like, 
I bet there were home economists involved in that because like it just sounded like the kind of thing they would be doing. And you know, the military food center didn't know anything like or they're like scratch their heads over that. Like they didn't know anything about it. Um, but I eventually dug around and I said, oh yes, indeed, like there were dietitians who, you know, over time it became possible to become a dietitian without going through a home economics program. But, you know, and there was also a part of nutrition that came from like animal nutrition as well. But, you know, for decades, like dietetics was a foundational part of home economics. And so, yes, all of these, I found out about these various women, B. Finkelstein and a few others who were working for the military, working on rations and studying nutrition and like how people, like coming up with a challenge of like rations that like soldiers would eat, which you'd think it would be really easy because well, like, it's incredibly demanding work, but it turns out to be very complicated. And they got pulled into the space. They were these, you know, like incredibly precise scientists who got pulled into the space program and things like, I mean, one of them, I'm blanking on her name, but she was at the University of Carol of California, Berkeley. Doris, uh, her first name was Doris, has Doris Calloway. Uh, Army's man, avoided like civilian Army's man of the year, a like man of the year plaque she kept on her in her office proudly. Um, but she measured like just, she had these incredibly precise studies of the like micro, grams of nutrients that bot, like that your body uses over the course of a day because you know, there's just no margin for error with space right like you're sending these people up there you they can't every cubic inch on the shuttle is valuable and needed and they can't have like this is before they had successfully sent anybody up into space so they just couldn't like get it wrong of like what sort of food to put up there. And then these women also just things like crumbs, like you couldn't have crumbs floating around the capsule because it could clog an air vent. So, and you know, people didn't even know whether you could like eat in zero gravity, right? Like whether your, whether human bodies would work in zero gravity. So it's actually, and some of my favorite writing in the book because it, it is such a like a sort of fun topic and also you know to learn that these developments all came in like filtered into our food system today like the you know powdered mixes that are in you know some of our like you know like shelf stable you know like products come from because they worked on a million different ways of freeze drying like the capri sun pouch as a child of the 80s i was like the capri sun pouch <laughs> you know that came from that research as well i was very into that and talking about how precise they have to be about sending things into space it reminded me of a recent news story where um they tried to send a woman into space with like 200 tampons for like a month long journey and I was like, you know what? After reading this book, I'm like, they needed a female home economist on that team. Right. And you know, I looked, one of the pieces I, I did not track down. And if anybody knows anything about this, please email me. I went to Purdue to the archives of Lillian Gilbreth, the mom and cheaper by the dozen. And somebody told me that they had seen at some point a space glove that said like that said it was like you know the because the work of the purdue like astro engineering program and then like tiny print like and the home economics department i have not been able like i checked with the archivists who work on the space program archives there nobody knows what i'm talking about uh and I really looked to see like whether there were home economists involved in spacesuits, and it looks like not. But that's one of those places where I'm like, ah, I still wouldn't be surprised if there is, like, some home ec connection because they did so much on like textiles, and it's well, it is well known that the rubber in those early spacesuits was that was all created by the Playtex company. So it was like, I mean, those spacesuits were like derived from girdles. 
<laughs> oh, good old girls. Well, um, I think we're getting some good questions. I think maybe okay. we should start turning over. Yeah, Jamie, let's let's hear it. Yes, and that this has been so interesting. Thank you both so much. We do have quite a few questions, so I'm just gonna jump right in. Autumn is wondering, do you feel that there is a connection between the historical origins of home economics work and the modern social system? Was there a connection between the social work movement in cities during the progressive era and the home economics movement? That is a really great insight. And the answer is absolutely yes. And they were, you know, inter- woven and they were both part of, yes, this progressive movement of improving society, consumer protection, social work. Jane Addams attended a bunch of the early American Home Economics Association conferences and you know, home economists worked with her, especially because they um, used to use tenement house, like there were home economists in tenement houses to, in centers to you know, provide resources for immigrant families, which could sometimes be really, really like patronizing and judgmental and racist and like, you know, we need to Americanize you to be sure. Uh, and one of the most fascinating points of connection, I think I mentioned her once in the entire book, is a woman named Safanisba Breckenridge, who was head of social, I think she was the, the founding dean of social work at the University of Chicago. And she was very involved in the home economics movement as well. She's also one of the women, like it's a little, it's challenge, like looking at the queer history element, I talked to a bunch of, you know, his, queer historians and they were all warning me like, to be careful, like we have to be careful about putting contemporary labels on, you know, people in the past, but, and it's also hard to tell with some women who lived with women for their whole lives, you know, did they see those partnerships as being romantic or friends or chosen family or like, how would we, I, I mean, they're certainly, they were certainly living lives that were not the heterosexual mainstream for sure. But Sophonice Bre Breckenridge is one of the women who uh, the scholar Megan Elias uh, looked around in the records and found like to be like you know, that she did have like a life you know romantic relationships with other women so that's a sort of interesting biographical note as well yeah thanks for that answer that was super interesting um we have a question from isabel um she's wondering what do you think of the baking and gardening during the epidemic will it last is it good did people learn they like it or learn the chemistry yeah I have, I have, I have wondered that as well, um, because it was so. I mean, I was right. I finished the book uh, a few months into pandemic lockdowns, and you know, I and it really influenced how I wrote the conclusion, and also actually how I wrote the preface, which I you know left till the end. Um, I think that it speaks to the power of home in a lot of ways. You know, it was a fascinating time to really be stuck at home if you're lucky, you know, lucky enough to have a home. And uh, in some ways against the home economics idea that the home and the, is not like a safe place away from the world, but like, I mean, it's a place to be comfortable and, you know, nourished to be sure, but that it's, you know, intersects with the world that there's an ecological relationship between the two because home really was our safe place. And I certainly, I mean, stay home, right? That's what we were just all told over and over again. So I think it's interesting. I think it speaks to like the power of these the, like the power of homemaking, like I, that's not, I think, and I think it's important to be able to talk about that without it being like gendered, like everybody wants a home. Everybody wants to make a home. There's nothing and our society doesn't respect that and doesn't value it. Like there is no economic value in like literal economic value, right? To taking care of your own children. Um, it's only if you pay somebody else to do it that it becomes part of the money economy. Uh, and I don't know whether, I mean, I'm sure some, it will, 
I'm sure more people will be making sourdough bread like 10 years from now than would have without. Uh, but that's also, you know, it does also remind me that, you know, Ellen Swallow Richards would have thought that was a little bit, you know, not like she would have understood it as like a pursuit that people un were enjoying or that was like helping them deal with like hard times maybe but she th actually thought that like individual household kitchens was a real waste uh she write and i quote like a letter that she wrote that said something like you know we're not going to make a ton of progress until each household has like learned to stop loving the taste of its own particular bacteria <laughs> which and like that's what sourdough bread is right it is your own household's bacteria <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I think, and I think we all know that like you can do it to this sort of thing to procrastinate. Like I can, I am here to tell you that baking sourdough bread, which I have done for years, is not going to get your book on home economics written. <laughs> Thank you. We do have uh, quite a few comments. People really liked hearing about the change um, from human ecology or home economics. Uh, in particular, Charlene's wondering, didn't Cornell University change its name to human ecology in the 1970s? <clears throat> yep, yep, yep. And it was part of the same, higher ed started doing it first. So this, this just bid for greater respect by making their name sound less, uh, you know, choosing a less traditional name. Great. And Cassidy has both a comment and a question. It's a little bit long. Um, a question in the comment. Thanks so much for writing this book. I wrote my dissertation on home economics uh, 20 years ago and my oh, advice didn't let, let me touch on feminist subversive aspects of it. So yeah, she says, so I'm glad someone or that you had the chance to write it. Second, her question, have you looked into the USDA's Bureau of Home Economics and studied that aspect of the movement? They did a lot of cool stuff from the depression through the Cold War. Would love to hear what you know, think about it. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So let me, I, I, have, I did a lot on the Bureau of Home Economics and in fact, where's the photo I'm looking for? Here we go. Okay, this, top, this photo up top of this very like, Soigne looking working Pull it back lady. Just a little bit. Put a little bit. To it. Is this, can you guys see now? Up there. Yes. Great. Yes. So that is the Bureau of Home Economics uh, mechanic suit for World War II for women who were working as mechanics. They came up with, among other things, you know, this collection of sewing patterns for, called uh, work clothes for women that were for all, you know, women doing farm work, mechanics work, factory, nursing, labs, like all of that stuff. And they were all like precisely, they're all engineered, like every, every scene serves a purpose, they said. So yeah, they did fascinating stuff. And they were also, I mean, when they were founded in 1926, the single largest employer of women scientists in the US, which was really cool. And I also, Cassie, like you should tell me, like, like put in the chat, like who this professor was. And if they're still around, I will like send them a copy of the book because like that's, I think that's the thing. Like there's so much subverse, there's so much in this history that subverts what people think home economics is. And even just, you know, this is why I put, I, you know, talk about like, this is why I bothered to spend time like digging into how, trying to find out like how many of these women were queer because like it just so subverts this Donna Reed image that, you know, these were all, these were all independent career women, home economists for decades. They were respected, like they may, and and the ones who got married and had children were working moms. So it's just so not, it's so feminist and so subversive in so many ways. Thank you so much for that. And just so many comments coming in, thanking you both so much for being with us tonight. It was a really captivating topic. And for all of you who are asking, yes, it's being recorded. You will all receive an email tomorrow with the, a link to the recording, all of the details for where to buy the discount code. I'll also include Stephanie's Etsy. And yeah, so I hope you did nothing but watch tonight. And, um, <laughs> 
On that note, would one of you ladies like to take us out? Um, How about you, Danielle? Okay. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Here, I'm going to hold up my book. If Stephanie has hers, you can hopefully you guys can see it, seeing as I'm sitting awkwardly with my microphone as well. But yeah. Nine, but imagine feminist cross stitch right here. <laughs> I know, and I don't see. I'm not working on one of her Stephanie's designs at the moment, but I, I, I have made them. They're really, they're really fun, and people like to get them as gifts. Copperfields hasn't censored me, so buy it from them. Yes, yes, I'll include that in the email as well. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you both. Hopefully, we'll get you in person real soon. Stephanie, I would really love your that new book and Danielle definitely. So, um, yeah, thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a great evening. Yep. Thank you, everybody.